I have just one more mainline classic game to review, and of course it's Mega Man 11. There's still a part of me that feels like I don't completely understand this one, but hey, I can't put it off forever, and if there's still some things I don't get after multiple playthroughs, two in a matter of days, that might be more on the game than me. So, I'll do my best, explain things as well as I'm able, and maybe figure some of it out as I put it into words. And as just a bit of a disclaimer, while I will discuss the difficulty options later in, for most of this, I'll be doing it from the perspective of normal difficulty. So then, I'm Wes, The Explosion, and this is Mega Man 11, the only Mega Man game designed for modern consoles. The game starts out with a flashback, Doctors Light and Wily competing over a grant during their college days. Light wants to make robots free thinking, while Wily insists on using them as tools and upgrading them with his prototype double gear system to make them more useful. Light wins approval and Wily stomps off in disgust, throwing his invention on the ground. Recalling the events in a dream, he's inspired to complete his double gear system, then kidnaps eight robots undergoing tune-ups at Light's labs, installing the system and reprogramming them to help in his newest world domination plan. Light worries that Mega Man won't be strong enough to take on the upgraded Robot Masters, but after a bit of insistence, installs Wily's discarded prototype in him so that he can stand a chance. As the plot goes along, Light talks to Mega Man about the past and regrets that he and Wily weren't able to come to a compromise back then, and at the end, even tries to frame Mega Man using the double gear as a sort of collaboration between the two. Anyway, it all gives us some insight into Thomas and Albert's past. It also seems a bit ironic, since Light's research is ultimately what leads to the robot apocalypse, with the advent of Reploids and Mavericks. He treats the double gear as wrong and kind of immoral, since it puts a dangerous strain on a robot's systems, but really, that's only an issue if they're given free thought. It feels a little hypocritical, given that he acquiesces to Mega Man using it a bit too easily, temporarily gives it to Otto at the end of the game to work him like a dog, and they live in a society where robots are just scrapped once they get too old. I totally get why Wily is so angry when Light uses his research as soon as it's convenient, though Albert should know plenty about that. And it is kinda sweet how Light seems to genuinely regret losing his friendship with Wily and wishes to rekindle it. It certainly explains why he's so quick to give him a second and third and fourth chance in previous games, but still. Maybe it wouldn't have been so difficult if he wasn't such a dick about the whole double gear thing originally. Either way, while the story can feel a bit illogical or contradictory at points, it gives us a good bit of lore and insight into some of the characters, so I do kind of enjoy it. Rejoice, for once again, Mega Man can not only jump and shoot, but also slide and charge his buster. Rush also comes back with Coil and Jet, the latter still working like it did after 3, auto flying ahead. The shoulder swap is also back, but you can also quick change between weapons by flicking the right stick in a specific direction. Still not something I'm used to, but it's something I've seen speedrunners use to great effect. It kinda reminds me of how you could map a few shortcuts for the powers in Mighty No. 9 to instantly change to your most used, rather than cycle through or use the pause menu. It's done better here though since you can use it for all 8 weapons, rather than having to pick and choose 3. The store is back, and while the economy isn't quite as broken as in 10, it can still really unbalance things. You can stock up on tanks and lives pretty quick, and there are even a ton of permanent upgrades you can equip, like auto charge, bigger shots, and less knockback. It's a combo of 9 and 10's one-time power-ups, and 8's equipable stuff, and it can make a lot of difference for a playthrough. They're not too stingy with bolts, so if you're having issues, you can use the shop to compensate. Not everything is available from the start, some stuff showing up based off of how you're playing, and if you happen to start a game on a Saturday, you can get something that makes bolts drop more often, so you can really abuse the shop. If the game's too hard but you're too proud to drop difficulty, the shop will be a lifesaver. The big thing, though, is the double gear system. Wily's magnum opus. Well, at least until he completes zero. Sorry, Vase. This allows Mega Man to momentarily boost his normal abilities. The speed gear slows down your perspective of time making it easier to dodge around stuff, kind of like playing one of the NES games when there's too much on screen at once. And while everything else is slowed down, your buster is not, so you can rapid fire. Most enemies seem to have little to no iframes, so you can really hammer on the damage. The power gear makes your attacks more powerful, and a full charge fires two meaty blasts, one right after the other. You can also use either gear in conjunction with your special weapons, with the power gear either making the attacks bigger or just throwing out more of them at once. While I wish it were more complex than that, I do understand. 
The whole powered up specials doing something new is more of an X thing, and the power gears based off of just making what you already have stronger, so it makes sense. Anyway, you can't just use it willy nilly. Every second you have it on accumulates heat. Switch it off and the heat gets vented. Let it go on for too long and Mega Man will overheat, and you'll have to wait for it to dissipate. Not the biggest punishment since you have to wait for it to go down regardless, but it does cut down on your moment to moment options. There's a new enemy drop that looks like a gear that will clear some of your heat out. And if you're low on health, you can use both gear settings at once for a short stint, but doing so will immediately put you in overheat. It's an interesting addition to the formula, and a lot of the enemies and stage designs revolve around it. They throw a lot of stuff on screen at once at points, so that either using the speed gear to help you maneuver around things, or the power gear to wipe stuff out quick will help. And a lot of enemies have shields that you can stun, but only very briefly with a charge shot. So either slowing them down to land hits in that brief window or just doing the double shot tend to be the best solutions. You can tell that they put a lot of thought into making double gear practical to use, rather than just a generic ability enhancing power up. Oh, and one last thing worth mentioning, there is no autosave in a game that came out five years ago. While doing it manually isn't too hard, at the same time, it's such a standard feature that it's easy to put the game down to take a break, then come back to it only to discover all your progress gone. So uh, just be careful and maybe avoid a rage quit. The weapons don't do anything too crazy. For the most part, they're just basic attacks but at different angles. Block dropper drops blocks, which also pass through walls, so it's good for hitting vertically, be it high or low. Tundra Storm attacks above and below, so it does the same but in a much narrower and closer range and can freeze some stuff. Like the damn fire and torch man stage. Scramble Thunder is just plug ball, but doubled. What the heck? Anyway, if you can land it on the same surface as an enemy, it should race forward and crash into them, doing a bit of damage over time. You can also use it for illumination, so that's a nice bonus. Blazing Torch shoots up at a slight angle before arching back down, so it's another one that's good against foes at awkward spots. It can also ignite explodable blocks. Bounce Ball is just Rebound Striker, but with more balls at once, with more erratic ricochets. It's even good against the electric boss that sometimes hangs out out of your typical reach. Chain Blast fires out a bomb that attaches to an enemy and blows up after a while, though you can detonate them early with an input. You can link multiple ones at once for bigger boons. Pile Driver shoots you forward, dealing damage if you collide with an enemy, so you can use it to clear some tricky jumps as well. Acid Barrier is the shield weapon this time, but with a few twists. It blocks projectiles, though not direct enemy collisions. Rather than having a limit to how much damage you can take, it instead fades over time and you can kinda see it shrinking as a way of warning. It can also fire off shots of acid while it's active for offense, with only the shield activation taking weapon energy. So yeah, nothing too special, but all of them are different enough in where they hit that they're worth playing around with and figuring out the best place to use them. And while it doesn't seem like their ammo consumption is as good as in some past rosters, between all the refills, the shop letting you stock up on W tanks, which refill all your specials, and the power gear letting you waste most bosses with their weakness, you don't need to be too stingy, just not stupid. The stages are all over the place in quality, but let's start with the basics. First, each stage is a bit longer than the standard classic stage. Well, that or my mind's playing tricks on me, since I never measured them. Still, there's only 12 of them, 8 for the Robot Masters, and 4 Wily stages, one of which is pretty much just the boss rush, and another is just a ride on a platform followed by Wily, so the longer individual stages kinda makes up for the small total number. Second, each standard stage has a sub-boss, a few making you fight theirs twice under different circumstances. While a lot of them can be kind of annoying, it's still nice that every Robot Master gets one. It always felt a little lopsided when some did, some didn't, and some got a slew. Remember when Ringman got half of 4's sub-boss budget? For individual stages, some are pretty fun, like Tundra Man's where you use the wind at your back to make big jumps, and Fuse Man's where you have to carefully move in between lasers, ducking behind barriers for protection at points. Some are harrowing, such as Blast Man's where you have to outrun explosions, Gear Fortress 1, where you need to be constantly hopping from one gear to another, and Gear Fortress 2, where you need to stay ahead of a skull-faced mech. Some are annoying, like Bounce Man stage, which is like Spring Man's, but with round bounce physics this time so that your trajectories are harder to control, as well as slappy blocks that sometimes block your way, other times being needed for jumps that don't always work right. Block Man's, with a lot of falling blocks and a good number of conveyor belts, or Impact Man's, 
where you're stuck on small platforms while attacks constantly fly your way with little room to dodge. Impact Man's the biggest turd of a robot master, by the way, being three robots in one so he's ganging up on you by default, and attacking you often in his stage when you can't fight back. We'll discuss him as a boss later, but I just hate him as a character due to his stage. Then there's a few that seem to take things too far. Acid Man's being painted in spikes, while Torch Man has a lot of sections that has a rubber banding wall of flame that you need to stay ahead of. While you can freeze it, that requires having the Tundra Storm at the ready rather than the Buster for the smaller enemies that are in your path, and a death can see you repeating not just the chase sequence that you died on, but a previous one as well. And for a more general complaint, there's several areas where you can't see as much of the screen as you need to, there being spikes either above or below the screen that you need to take leaps of faith into, which I consider more cheap than challenging. Of course, all of this is subjective. I could see people dividing things up just like I did, but putting the stages into different categories, like swapping cues and bounce, or describing what I'd call unfair in Torchman's stage like I did in Blastman's. Exciting. My overall point is, the stages can be fun, they can be frustrating. Overall, I think I have more fun than not, but at the same time, I think there are some balance issues and some stuff that I would definitely change, if not just straight out a race. The boss battles in this can feel pretty different, since you have four options for fighting them. The first is to go in, buster only, if you're doing a challenge run or just want to be a big swinging sausage about it. The next is to use their weakness, which can take them out decently fast. The third is to use the power gear to rack up some damage quick, a lot of times it feeling like it does the job faster than the actual weakness and making it so that the boss order is a lot less important than normal. And the fourth is to combine two of the options, using the traditional weakness with the power gear to absolutely eviscerate the boss. The last option is worth exploring since the bosses themselves can also use the double gear, either power or speed, to make your job more difficult. This happens when you deal enough damage to them, but not quite enough to kill them, and while I think it might vary based on difficulty, if you putz around too much on normal, they'll bust it out twice, but if you're fast enough, they won't even get the chance to use it once. While it can be frustrating when you don't have a strategy down, I like how it rewards high level play. As for the individual bosses, Impact Man throws his weight around to mess up your footing, also trying to ram you and lay a few obstacles down. His power gear turns him into a giant pile driver that will try to crush you three times. Bounce Man bounces around, occasionally trying to ground pound or punch you. If you hit him hard enough, he'll go to pieces before reforming after a few seconds. His speed gear still has him bouncing, but much faster and more erratically. Fuse Man teleports around, throwing electricity, leaving lines of it in his wake, and two balls of energy circling the room. His speed gear has him zipping around before crashing down several times. Tundra Man skates around, doing spins and kicks and his speed gear has him doing the same, but faster. Torchman thinks there's a street fighter and punches out fireballs, gets in close for kicks, and leaps up for dive kicks. His power gear has him throwing out what looks like Hell's Rolling three times before crashing down in a pillar of flames. Blastman hops around, throwing bombs that you need to weave between. Some explode on contact, others home in when you get close and blow up after several seconds. His power gear does the same, but bigger. Blockman runs around, sometimes hops, and drops blocks on you. When you get him down to his last bit of health, he picks a corner and throws blocks horizontally in a hissy fit. His power gear is probably the most troubling. Him creating a block golem that can only be hit in the red circle on his chest, can punch, slap, and throw blocks, and has its own health bar that needs to be depleted before you can start attacking Blockman again. Finally, Acid Man puts up a barrier that you need to destroy before jumping around and shooting goo at you. His speed gear has him dashing through the liquid under the floor, creating waves of acid as he passes, before jumping up and unleashing a barrage from his buster, which he repeats several times. Not a bad set of fights. While a few of them can be a bit annoying, like how Fuse Man is all over the place and Torch Man can get just a bit too in your face, the counters you have are good enough that you don't have to put up with them if you don't want to. The only one that really bugs me is Block Man, since he gets multiple health bars for his block hole, at times up to three if you're not playing well. He's the only one that really does this, and I'm not sure why he gets the special treatment, but there typically is one boss that tends to be a good deal harder than the rest, so I guess it tracks. He's just the last one I probably would have guessed to be taking that distinction. As for the fortress bosses, there's only two. Yellow Devil acts similarly to how he did in the original game, but I swear the window his eye is open for feels a lot shorter. His speed gear has him splitting into a bunch of mini devils and running around the last to appear being vulnerable to attack, so pay attention. 
otherwise things will drag on. Then you have this weird sphere thing that shoots out random blasts of energy while moving around the screen. Hit it to open it up and then strike the vulnerable head inside. Its power gear has it warping around and releasing just one big blast of energy at a time. Wily has two forms, the first floating around with several helicopter blades while firing missiles, the ones that come at you vertically also serving as platforms. That seems somehow familiar. At certain points, it'll pop out landing gear to turn the floor into a treadmill to drag you towards him, firing twirling balls of energy as well as missiles. While it might be a little tricky in protracted battles, it's not too hard if you use your resources. Heck, if you use powered up chain bombs, you don't even need to be too accurate with your shots. The second form is a capsule that has Wily swooping around, throwing gears your way, occasionally moving back and forth across the screen while spinning gear hammers around him to hit you, and finally activating double gear to teleport into one part of the screen before flying to the opposite side. You need to vary your approach based on what he's doing, and it feels a little random whether you'll be able to counterattack him or not. While I like the Robot Masters, most of these fights don't really do it for me. Devil can be pretty annoying. For the sphere, I just kinda spray and pray with the bounce balls, first Wily seems too simple, and final feels too inconsistent. I don't know, maybe I'm going too hard on some of them while not hard enough on others, but they tend to feel more like a chore than a proper challenge. The game looks… kinda cartoony. Not quite Cuphead level, but I think it feels really appropriate for the series. Mega Man's got a few extra seams in his costume to add some extra detail, and heck, they even do the Mighty Number no. 9 thing for Rock. His different power is not just changing his suit's coloration, but him taking on traits of the bosses he got him from. I think that's the second time I've mentioned that game. Anyway, the swaps look really good and add a lot more personality to each of your weapons. Besides that, returning characters are well adapted to the new art style, light, auto, and rush all looking good, with Roll even getting a new outfit that looks somewhere between her NES dress and the one she had in 8. Most enemies and bosses fit in well for Mega Man, being more detailed than the NES robots but not so complex that their functions get lost. I think the biggest thing that I notice, though, are some of the environments you traverse. The foregrounds tend to be mostly simple platforms, but if you look at the backgrounds, they really do a lot. There are campground signs in the park Torchman lurks in, Mayan-looking pyramids in Blockman's stage, a dome where you can view the stars outside in Bouncemans, and partially unearthed fossils in Tundramans, to name a few. Not only that, but they can also vary a bit just in the same stage, rather than just copy and pasting the same few screens throughout. While I might have mixed feelings on the actual stage layouts, when it comes to just visuals, they all deliver. I'd say the soundtrack is pretty mediocre, which, for Mega Man, makes it one of the weaker ones. If I had to rank them all, I'd put it just over X7s, which, yeah, ain't too flattering. While no track is particularly bad, all of them sound pretty samey. There's just something about the style that makes them hard to differentiate. I still have trouble telling them apart sometimes, and honestly, I don't think it'd be hard to string them together and convince someone that they're all actually the same song. The only track that really stands out to me is the one for the Wily stages, which is actually kinda rockin' and gets me feeling pretty hype. The rest just feel like generic video game music. That said, there is DLC that lets you swap out for a looped instrumental version of many of the tracks. These give off completely different vibes. The big one that stands out for me is Fuse Man's, one of the better ones in my opinion that originally does manage to sound a little intense. When I changed instrumentals though, all of a sudden I was hit with a melancholy piano sonata, completely changing how the level comes across and making me feel fancy and classy in the process. And it does similar things for the rest of the game. A big part of it is just the range of instruments they use, making each track feel distinct and memorable, and getting across a variety of emotions in the process. Some pep you up, some feel a bit creepy, some are relaxing, and, like I said, some feel a little sad. It's night and day between the two versions, and if you get the chance, I highly recommend playing with the instrumental one on. Wish I could've used it during streamer here, but I just get the sinking feeling that I'd be asking for a copyright strike. The game also has voice acting, which is nice, and I think everyone does a good job, matching the more cartoony vibe. But the main characters aren't quite what I expect. Mega Man's voice is a bit deeper, and Dr. Wily doesn't have a German accent, so I guess I was looking for a cross between 8 and the Ruby Spears, but just because it doesn't match my biases doesn't make the dub bad, and I think the individual Robot Masters work pretty well. You can break the difficulty down into three aspects. The first is simply the different difficulty settings. Newcomer, Casual, Normal, and Superhero. 
The lower difficulties offer more checkpoints, lives, less damage taken, and better power-ups lying around the stage. Nothing too wild, but I appreciate that they do more than just throw in some simple damage modifiers. Then there's the new mechanics that you have to get used to. While you can get through the entire game without activating the double gear once, the game really wants you to. And getting when to use it, how much it can take before overheating, and how long the cooldown lasts is pretty key to you having a good time. Lastly is just the game itself. I swear, this game has you taking some of the most knockback in any classic title though you can eliminate a good bit of it with the shop upgrade. That does bring out how the game's economy can wind up breaking a good deal of the challenge. There's also this dumb thing where better power-ups in some of the stages can only be grabbed once. While I kinda get why they don't want you grinding a stage for E-Tanks, though I think it should be allowed, it's kind of annoying when extra lives don't respawn between game overs. Clearly, I don't have it anymore. You can put it back. Combine that with the stage stuff we talked about earlier, the longer lengths, abundance of sub-bosses, and some sections being especially aggravating or punishing, and there are a lot of times that the game can feel like it crosses the line from challenging but fair to just plain bullcrap. Maybe it's a combination of Eleven being different enough that not all my skills transfer from the other classic entries, combined with this being the one I played the least, but I would still say that this is one of the harder titles. When the game first came out, I had a lot of trouble and just attributed it to me being out of practice. When I came back to it a year ago, after I played through the other classic games, I had such a rough time that I swore that the people who made it didn't understand Mega Man, and it was shoddily put together. I then dropped down to casual, did a practice run where I learned to make use of the double gear, and had a much better time when I raised it back up to normal. And this week, I was pretty miserable when I played it in two parts, Sunday and Monday, then had my best run ever when I streamed it on Tuesday. I guess what I'm saying is that practice, especially when it comes to the double gear in the stages, is important. More so than pretty much any classic game outside of 9. Luckily, you have enough options that you can get some in with whatever restrictions or allowances you want, which is a godsend. I'd recommend casual for veteran players who just never touched this entry yet, and for newcomers? While I've never played the difficulty level of the same name, I'd still probably recommend picking up one of the Legacy Collections and getting the basics down first before trying to learn how to deal with all the extra crap this one throws at you. While I once said that Mega Man 8 felt like a spin-off rather than a mainline, Eleven almost feels like a well-made fan game. The basics are there, they even bring back some functions people missed in 9 and 10, and there's a new mechanic that you've never seen and wouldn't expect in this series, but at the same time, the difficulty balancing and level design doesn't quite feel like where it needs to be, and while the instrumentals are really good, the base OST isn't up to standards. You can certainly tell that Capcom hasn't done one of these games in a while, and that likely the team doing so was largely changed. Still, it is nice that we actually got something new. Five years ago. As for whether I like it or not, it really depends on the day. One playthrough, I'll absolutely despise this game. The next, I'll walk away feeling pretty darn good and waiting for Mega Man 12. I think the more I play it, the more I'll like it. And while saying it's an acquired taste isn't the highest praise, there are several Mega Man games that I know I'll never come around on, so I'll take it. One last thing worth mentioning is this game's relationship to Mighty No. 9. I always thought that Eleven was a response to the massive Kickstarter success, showing the demand for a new Mega Man game, or at least an alternative. But Eleven was announced a year after Mighty No. 9 came out and bombed, so perhaps it was more due to the moderate success of the Legacy Collections. Then again, maybe those were in response to Mighty No. 9, do we have a quick way of abbreviating that other than the initials? So the logic might still hold. Either way, I do like that they seem to have pulled a few of the new ideas that worked in that title. Probably the weapon change shortcuts, and definitely the costume changes to make the main character look more like the bosses. And since that game was inspired by Mega Man, you can't even raise a fuss about them copying it. Really should do a review on that one at some point. But I'm off topic now. So hey, what do you think? Was Eleven a hit, or did they get things wrong? Do you like the double gear, or think it gives you way too much to juggle? And is this one hard, or am I just too dumb to use the new mechanics? That'll do it for this week, so thanks as always for watching, and maybe consider subscribing if you're into Mega Man. Really need to figure out what I want to do when I reach 500.